Hello friends, welcome back to another episode of Dig It With Raven. I'm coming at you today from the Imperial War Museum here in London to bring you a very special collaboration with over 20 other history YouTubers all about the history and science of the Cold War. It is sweltering today in London and the irony is not lost on me that I am filming about the Cold War on one of the hottest days of the year. But let's get into it i want to talk about the archaeology of the cold war now you might be wondering what the heck is an archaeology channel doing on a collaboration about the cold war when it ended in 1989 and to be honest i asked that question as well until i did some digging is there actually any archaeology that can be done about the cold war and if so what does it have to do with vip bathrooms stick around and you just might find out The Cold War was unlike any other war in human history. It's crazy to think that this is the only conflict in the history of the world that could have ended with the annihilation of life on Earth. Fueled by paranoia and secrets and driven by monumental advances in science and technology, the Cold War impacted almost every aspect of life in the second half of the 20th century. And that influence continues even today. Even though the Cold War ended in the late 1980s, it did begin in the late 1940s, which means that a lot of the buildings built early on during the Cold War have now reached that 50 year mark where they count as archeology span in the United States. So that means some investigations have actually gone through on Cold War infrastructure and Cold War sites through an archeological lens. When archeologists research the Cold War, there are three main lenses through which we interpret our data conflict archaeology, the archaeology of science, and the archaeology of the recent or contemporary past. I don't have time in this video to go through all three of those lenses in depth with you, nor do I have time to do like a full tirade on the archaeological work being done about the Cold War in North America, let alone the rest of the world. So this video is solely just going to focus on why archaeological research is important for the Cold War and what it can tell us, even though we have so much documentation and oral history for this point in time, for this moment in history. And I want to focus mostly on the North American side because that's where I was able to get most of my information from. So if you want to get more resources on the archaeology of the Cold War, a really good jumping off point is this book, The Archaeology of the Cold War by Todd A. Hansen. It focuses on North American sites and a little bit on Cuba, but it is very comprehensive and it's just a really good intro for that area of study. I have left a link to that book just in my description down below if you want to go and check it out. Now all these books and other resources of the Cold War are going to give you tons of information about the politics, the people, the technology, and you know, the drama of the whole thing. And yeah, those things are really interesting and vital to understanding the whole situation. But something that we should all take into consideration when looking at the Cold War and everything like that is the landscape of the activities and that the Cold War left behind. All of that mundane everyday stuff, all of the things that were going on with the people that were working in these big research facilities, in these nuclear test plants, in all these government buildings, and even in our own backyards. For example, thousands and thousands of fallout shelters were built in domestic homes. And many were built in secret under the cover of darkness so that their neighbors didn't find out where they were so they could also seek shelter if, for example, a nuclear bomb was imminently approaching. But building a bunch of them in secret means that we'll actually never know how many are out there. And that is a really fun thing for future archaeologists to discover when they're digging up more suburban sites from the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, everywhere like that. And that is something that archaeology is really going to be able to push the boundaries with, I would say, because then we'll actually get a better understanding of the local domestic impact of the Cold War on living situations and also fallout shelter design and all these things that we don't really know about yet because again, secrets. There's a very secretive war. A lot of secretive things were happening. Everyone was a spy. And one thing that we can't lie about is our physical evidence. The things that we leave behind. We can lie about what we say, what we do, 
everything like that. You can always put up this facade, especially, you know, with the Cold War, everything is about secrets and games and espionage. But what you leave behind will actually tell you the truth. And that is very exciting for archaeologists. But of course, you know, domestic sites aside, let's not just forget the structures of all these other big sites, these testing sites, the control centers, the command centers, the defense buildings, the uranium processing plants, all of these have left an archaeological landscape in North America, in Canada, in the US, around the world that can be studied by archaeologists. These buildings were constructed to endure. They involved massive amounts of concrete in order to protect the people, the information, and the technology from even the deadliest of blasts. So that means these, these guys, they're not going anywhere anytime soon unless we raise them to the ground. And with so much having been built during the Cold War for these operations, you'd think that we would have a ridiculous amount of physical evidence, especially archaeological evidence, to study. But a lot of these buildings have been decommissioned and therefore just raised to the ground. So there's no physical evidence left. Regardless of all this intentional destruction of sites in order to, you know, protect secrets, whatever their reasoning is, there's still an immense collection of infrastructure that can give us insight into parts of the Cold War that aren't accessible from archival or oral histories. Usually when we think about a recent historic event where there's lots of documentation, a lot of evidence that way, we may not see the imminent need for archaeology, but we could not be more wrong. Because remember, history is written by the victors, what's written is biased and often curated, and people's memories fade and are also influenced by their life experiences. Physical archaeological evidence helps corroborate and correct certain anecdotes or stories and kind of helps with our understanding of other people's understandings of the events. Let me give you an example by talking about the Cold War site of Bikini Atoll. Bikini Atoll is a coral reef in the Marshall Islands that consists of 23 islands surrounding a lagoon. The atoll was the center of US nuclear weapons testing in the Pacific, and it was here that the most powerful nuclear weapon ever exploded occurred in 1954. Bikini Atoll was also the very first Cold War site to be put on the UNESCO World Heritage List. In 1989, an archaeological team carried out an underwater survey of what was called the Ghost Fleet. It's very, very exciting. There were 21 ships that were all sunk to the bottom of the lagoon in July of 1946 because they were part of the Abel and Baker atomic weapons tests of Operation Crossroads. Don't ask me what any of that means because I am not an American historian. I am not a Cold War historian. Let's just move on to the bigger picture. These 21 ships were the most damaged of the 95 that took part in this explosion. And while most of them survived, they were irreversibly irradiated. So they had to just sink them down. And I guess that makes sense when you are dropping nuclear bombs on ships. The archaeologists were able to survey 11 of the ships and they also collected sediment samples for radiation testing. No proper excavations could take place unfortunately due to radiation hazards and also the fact that these ships were loaded with live ammunition before the atomic bomb went off to simulate like real warfare and not all of the the artillery was actually detonated when it got hit by the bomb so when you're digging underwater around live munitions that's no like i'm all for some risk in archaeology i'm all for you know playing the game climbing a thing balancing on another thing but with live munitions no thank you even though they weren't able to properly excavate, they were able to do a lot of technical drawings and do narrative site descriptions, which helped solve a decades long Operation Crossroads mystery. Ooh, exciting. It was believed that the USS Arkansas battleship was lifted pretty much just completely out of the water and drawn up into the stem of the mushroom cloud during the test explosion. The story was almost completely uncontested because we had eyewitness accounts and we had photographs that apparently proved this occurrence. But I don't know about you guys, this ship weighed 26,000 tons and it was just standing upright in a mushroom cloud. Like, it sounds pretty fantastic, but I would definitely want to see a little bit more solid evidence if this actually happened. And this is why archaeology is so great because they found the boat underwater and all of the physical evidence that they saw suggested that the boat sunk within seconds of the nuclear bomb detonation, which means it was pretty much just 
hammered down to the bottom of the lagoon before any of the debris or the mushroom cloud would actually raise up into the air. So that means people just saw something fantastic or maybe one person saw it and they're like, oh yeah, did you do that? And no one wanted to miss out on the, you know, being that person that didn't see what happened. You know, you know that, you've been there, right? There, you, you have the earthquake or something and people are like, did you feel the earthquake? And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, oh, did you see that thing? And you didn't want to be that person. It's like, no, I missed out. The major case of FOMO, you just kind of go, yeah, that was really cool. So that was kind of what happened with the USS Arkansas. And while it is a really fun Cold War story, this fun example really just goes to show that even though we have so much archival and personal references for the history of the Cold War, Archaeology can really just help us see the bigger picture, can round out some things, and can even correct some stories that were thought to be true for years and years. Not only can archaeology help just corroborate and correct all of these stories, it can also work its magic on the mundane things, the everyday going-ons of these Cold War sites, which is something that we don't get a lot of because people would think that a lot of things were classified and you wouldn't really go into some things. There were things that were maybe important now for us, for archaeologists, aren't weren't deemed important for documentation at the time. For example, like what people wore, what they ate, what was going on, the games that they played when they were, you know, off duty, things like that, that we don't get to see in the official political documentation. So to look at that, let's leave the islands and move inland to Nevada, shall we? The Nevada test site was arguably the epicenter of Cold War nuclear testing. Over 100 above ground tests were conducted with many more taking place underground during its 41 year history. The site has been studied by archeologists over the past 30 years and they've come across some very interesting finds. The Nevada test site is huge and there's so many different facets to it with the archaeology. So I'm just gonna focus on Camp Desert Rock. If you wanna know more, check out the archaeological reports done at this site. I will link all of that down into my description. Camp Desert Rock is a abandoned military cantonment. I don't know military terms, but it was a place for US military to observe test explosions from 1951 to 1957. It was thought that it was really important for American soldiers to witness atomic bomb explosions firsthand before if, before any sort of conflict, just so they could deal with the physical and psychological aspects of seeing this complete and total destruction. In 1997, archeologist Susan Edwards surveyed the site and she found quite a lot of stuff. She found concrete building foundations, rock line platforms for tents, roadways, communications infrastructure, a lot of things that could really give us some really detailed information on daily life at this site. Her study showed that life at Camp Desert Rock was not so enjoyable, especially at the beginning of in its early years. Housing for everyone was in 12 man tents. There were dirt floors. There wasn't even a sewer system until years later. Through her archeological and archival research though, she was able to know that the living conditions did improve drastically over time. But over the next six years, a medical dispensary was added. There was an open air movie theater, a barber shop, a chapel, a library, a phone line. The tents were winterized. There was even a beer tent added to the camp. And honestly, if it weren't for the whole mess of like, you know, seeing total destruction and witnessing nuclear explosions and irradiation and all that stuff, it sounds like a pretty fun summer camp for adults and I would totally go. By 1955, Camp Desert Rock had over 150 permanent buildings and it seemed like it was quite this little community. Like there was even a dry cleaning and a laundry service, so it wasn't you weren't really roughing it anymore down there. What's really cool and something that we would never have known from archival research or just gathering oral histories is the spatial divisions about the VIP bathrooms. And I know that sounds really weird to talk about when we're talking about the Cold War and toilets, but that's why I like archaeology and I want to tell you about bathrooms because because I can. When you are looking at the VIP bathrooms and the use of that area over time, there are multiple building additions at different times. For example, there was an increase in building size that held these VIP bathrooms and it expanded the number of toilets from three to nine, the number of showers from two to six, and the number of sinks from one to six. There was also a new layout that added a changing room and a locker area that was separate from the showers. This increase in the VIP bathrooms 
indicates that there probably was an increase in VIP visitors to Camp Desert Rock, which also means that there was a lot more VIPs coming to just watch nuclear explosions. Like these important people were just showing up to be like, yes, set up a bomb. I want to see what's up with this. The other interesting thing is that the separation of the changing area from the showers and the toilets meant that there was this degree of privacy that was offered to the VIPs that wasn't to the people that worked there and for the soldiers, which means that the people visiting and using these VIP bathrooms were probably not accustomed to normal military life. That means they weren't part of the American military. They could have been anybody. We don't unfortunately have a guest book for who came to the site and you know they signed off but it could have been celebrities it could have been diplomats it could have been political officials that weren't military based it could have been scientists we don't know but that is what is so cool about these toilets it really gives us a better idea of the demographics who are coming to the site and there is also maybe a shift in perception on nuclear testing maybe it wasn't just for the military anymore people were wanting to see it and we do see that with atomic tourism even today people are going to see these these cold war sites these atomic sites as part of a, a road trip and so maybe you know it could have been these people that were really important and had access to things or knew people that did could be like yeah you know what i want to use my privilege i want to go see a bomb explode and that's what we can tell about with vip bathrooms i love that i love it archaeology of toilets there needs to be more archaeology of the toilet just this whole everyday life stuff with archaeology just really helps make this bigger picture the whole social history of the cold war that we don't get with these official documents you know no one's gonna want to talk about the toilets no one no one's gonna remember the toilets and that my friends is why archaeology is so important to events in recent history, especially the Cold War. The Cold War, as I said, was a war of secrets, of secret keeping, and there were so many ambitious construction projects that were happening without the public's knowledge, without a lot of people's knowledge. A lot of things were going on behind these doors, behind these thick walls of concrete that we will never know about. And when we are looking for documentation of the Cold War, like, yes, some things do become declassified over time, but it can be difficult to get those documents, which means people have to rely a lot on redacted documents and oral histories from a generation that is aging, that maybe doesn't remember things as, as vividly or had, you know, has thought maybe that things that they know are too classified to divulge, even though the names of ships, the things that we wore, things like that, they were never really that classified to begin with, but because people think in this mindset, they don't want to give too much away. And that can be really difficult when studying a, a moment in history because we want those primary resources, but we need them to be as accurate and as detailed as possible. And that is becoming an issue, especially as the years go by. And yeah, sure, we do know a lot about the big events, but it's the mundane again, as I said, with archeology span that makes it so important. It's these seemingly mundane moments of life that gives us a much greater understanding of 20th century nuclear testing and the life of these people that un like went through it all and that un undertook it and witnessed it. And when I was reading Hansen's book about the archeology span of the Cold War, I came across this passage that he wrote that really kind of summed up the issues that we're having with all of these classified documents and these people not give, divulging all this information and the lack of information that we have, a lack of evidence that we have of the mundane every day. He said, without accessing knowledge held by American veterans, it seems likely that we may someday know less about everyday work at a Cold War Nike missile or nuclear weapons testing site than we do about daily life in ancient Rome. Just think about that, okay? That really sums it up because we know so much about daily life in ancient Rome. We know what people wore. We know about their pets. We know what they ate. We know how they partied. And we don't know any of this stuff for the Cold War. And that's why it's so important to get the oral histories, to get the archaeological evidence, and to really flesh out what we know. Because if we don't, it's just going to be a historical timeline. There's not going to be any life left to the history of the Cold War. And now I'm becoming preachy, but 
it is what it is, friends. Secrets don't make friends, guys. Like I've said it once, I'll say it again. They do not make friends and they definitely do not help us in our understanding of history. Even though conducting archeology span of the Cold War could be a little bit uh, iffy, let's say a little bit dangerous because you could be breathing in radioactive fallout you could be exposed to radiation, even though it's not as dangerous as people think uh, with the levels that they are in right now. The buildings are super old and rickety and they could just collapse on you. It is really, really important. And we all need to give a little bit more love to the archeology span of the recent past. So there you have it guys. Uh, pretty much just like a really weird summary of the archeology span of, of the Cold War and the things that we can find out what doing archeology span of the contemporary past and some weird stuff about bathrooms for you. So you have something fun to say at your next party that's a little bit random, but maybe you'll make a friend from it. If you like that video, go ahead and smash that like button down below. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and make sure that you go and watch the rest of the playlist of this Cold War collab, especially if you're like me and you don't know too much about the Cold War. This way you're gonna get to learn everything you need to know from these amazing history YouTubers. And I love them all. Subscribe to them all. Comment on them all. Do your thing. If you like my videos and you like what I do, you want to support the channel, head on over to Patreon and become a patron. The link is down in my description below. You get early access to all of my videos and you might even get your name on the screen as a supporter right here. Here are all my socials. And as always, stay dirty, my friends.